Good evening. Um, a warm welcome on this uh, beautiful spring day uh, to the audience, but especially, of course, to our uh, great panel that is uh, sitting uh, behind me, ready to engage in what I expect uh, to be a, a very interesting and inspiring uh, discussion today in this uh, episode, installment of the BK Talks. The title of BK Talks today is Data, Data, Data. And I think I can uh, absolutely say that uh, data is now the most discussed idea subject in academia at this moment in time. It relates to all disciplines in science, engineering, and design. <clears throat> what is data, how to collect data, how to use them, how to develop that into projects for artificial intelligence, etc., etc. The discussion is going on everywhere at this moment. But I think especially the connection of data to design, design being the core activity of this faculty, is still something that really needs to be explored. So I'm really happy that tonight we have a BK Talks on data. It's not only a BK Talks, but also parallel to the talks, the coming weeks you can see, I think, a really intriguing exhibition uh, of projects, ideas, artifacts sent in by members of our uh, Baukunde community. The, debate today will be uh, led by uh, Georg Frachliotis, he's sitting there in the middle. And I must say I'm really very happy with his arrival in our faculty now a year ago as a professor of architectural theory and digital culture. <clears throat> because I think he really manages, he knows how to connect the history of data, because data certainly has a history, it's not something of only a couple of years ago, with theory, and then to make that, I think, really complex connection to design. <coughs> so, I look forward to hear the panelists' approach and views on data and design, and maybe other connections as well. Um, I also want to thank the curatorial team, uh, Javier Arpa, Lex Telo, also standing somewhere, and their assistance of organizing this BK Talks and the beautiful exhibition. And that leads me just to handing over the microphone, as usual, to our curator, Javier. Thanks, Dick. Uh, very quickly, I just want to give the word to Georg so that, uh, so that the panelist starts. I just would like to thank everyone that has decided to contribute to uh, the exhibition that we are seeing here today. Um, it's not easy to do things so quickly, so thank you very much to those that send their work. We are surrounded by a robotic arm which is now being installed. Uh, during the four weeks of the exhibition, uh, students will be producing material and designs and the designs will be placed on the exhibition. Thank you very much to those that uh, sent the, their contribution. Um, we have uh, Chess Long over there, we have a planetoid, we have a, a version of Frank Lloyd Wright's Robin House, we have videos of how to digitalize, we have virtual uh, reality, we have a uh, something that is sensing our heart and that reacts to it. So please go and uh, join uh, and enjoy the exhibition. Uh, I want to thank Georg for uh, Fragiliotis. <laughs> thank you for uh, deciding or joining the, uh, uh, the uh, well, for accepting the invitation to moderate, uh, to moderate the BK Talks. He is in charge of the uh, new open initiative uh, that just, start, just started at the Faculty of uh, Architecture and the Real Environment. He will introduce properly our panelists to date, Henriette, Seiran, Matilde, Jarun, and Leo. So I just want to thank very much those that decided to send us their work so that we have an overview of what the school is doing when it comes to digitalization. And thank you very much, Lex, Robin, and Ifra, who did so much in order to have this done in a very, few, uh, in a very short period of time. Thanks a lot. Georg, the uh, floor is yours. Thanks very much.
Mr. Javier, and I also have to say uh, many thanks to the BK Talk uh, team. Perfectly organized, by the way. Um, so um, thank you, thank you very much. So um, I want to introduce uh, the panel we have today. Um, Javier put a fantastic panel together. Um, and yeah, the question of tonight is, of course, um, what is design in the age of AI? Whatever that means, right? We are still fighting about the question, what is design itself? Um, what is the age of AI? What is AI? So we have a lot of questions today and one line. So design in the age of artificial intelligence. Um, and let's say a few hypotheses before, before I um, introduce our panelists today. Let's say one of the, of the starting points should be um, the idea that architects and designers um, became, let's say, the curator of a data society. So I think that could be an interesting starting point for, for our discussion. Building standards, climate models, climate data, environmental data, material data. So in the end, the question is, is the architect the new curator of the, of the, of the data society? Um, and of course, the second hypothesis is that AI will change uh, how designers and architects think and also interact with systems, with materials, um, kind of analyzing, sensing, monitoring, visualizing, and also um, uh, modeling, of course, um, all kinds of, of objects, products, and, and buildings. The question, of course, is uh, how this is going to be, right? How will AI change design? That's, that's the second question. I will introduce our panelists uh, right now, and I think I have to uh, start with Henriette. Um, Henriette Beer is an associate professor in, uh, at BK, um, so we know you here. You are um, director or head of the robotic building um, lab here at, at, uh, at BK. Um, Henrietta has worked with Morphosis a um, long time ago, but still in the US and, and Europe, so kind of pioneering uh, era back then. Um, and also she has thought uh, all kinds of, let's say, digitally driven design uh, courses, uh, lectures, workshops um, in, uh, in Europe, not only in, in, uh, in, in the Netherlands, but also in the US. And um, I think uh, Henrietta is uh, like the, one of the key figures here at BK for uh, robotic questions uh, right now. So welcome, uh, Henrietta. Next to Henrietta, we have uh, Saron. Um, and I'm really happy that Saron is here. Um, also at, at, at BK, Saron is uh, assistant professor at the, uh, at the Theory of Architecture and Digital Culture Group, and also the, the co-director of uh, the new AI lab um, at our faculty, um, dealing with uh, design analysis and optimization in architecture and the built environment. Um, Saron was a, a postdoc researcher at BK um, for a few years, dealing with quite interesting topics, um, for example, with architecture history. So the idea how to combine computer vision and architecture history, um, Saron is the expert for that kind of uh, questions. And now she's with us, yeah, um, exploring the, the, the big question, how to combine AI and design. So welcome, Saron. I'm very happy um, that you are with us today. We have uh, Matilde Marengo. <clears throat> I'm very happy you made it. Um, from, uh, from Barcelona. Um, Matilde is an, an, an architect, a designer, and researcher, um, focusing on something, let's call it urban technology, or kind of combination of, of now you are not, you are disagree already, super. Um, let's say how to um, integrate technology into urban questions and urban phenomena. Um, Focusing, of course, on, on environmental, social, and, and uh, economic frameworks, right? So it's a, it's a bigger picture. And Matilde is head of studies and also faculty and a PhD supervisor at the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia's Advanced uh, Architecture Group. 
So um, uh, IAAC, right, OG, welcome uh, Matilda. We are very happy that you made it and I'm really curious to, uh, to hear your story um, today. We have Jerome van der Most um, next to me. Um, no architect, um, but you told me uh, like back then a trained data scientist, but now working as a uh, as a media artist, we are, you are creating um, art with data um, algorithms and also uh, with AI methods for almost ten years right now. Um, so I think that's going to be really interesting. Um, and for now, your, your research focus, it sounds very academic, but your artistic research focus um, is, the, let's say, the, the relationship between um, AI and natural surroundings or, or environment. Um, and <clears throat> his art, of course, um, is, is exhibited around the world. You can say this also in the New Zealand National Museum. It's quite interesting. ZKM, of course. Um, Dutch Design Week and also the AIF in Hong Kong. So welcome to our panel. It's uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And of course, Leo. Um, it's good to have you as well. Um, Leo Stuckart is is a, an architect and also a researcher um, with a strong focus, strong, strong focus on tooling or emerging technologies, computational tools, and also speculative design. And almost six or seven years ago, um, you joined MVIDV, uh, founded uh, MVIDV Next in 2017. So you're now the, the, the head of this think tank or the, the director of this think tank. Um, you did a lot of research at the uh, Strecker Institute, um, concerning the new normal, um, building a, a kind of platform, um, connecting design uh, and also governance-based uh, deep learning. Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think um, it's going to be fun, uh, Leo, and I'm really happy to, uh, to have you. So, what does it mean to design um, in, a, in a data society? I want to open this um, big question by um, <clears throat> kind of historical footnote. Um, since Christopher Alexander passed away last week, I thought it would be a nice uh, gesture to uh, start with, uh, with a very young Christopher Alexander. Um, and actually, um, few of you know maybe that, that Alexander was one of the first um, architects, but also design uh, researchers. Um, dealing or, or kind of critical um, dealing with issues of data and, and digitization. Um, we are in the 60s, 64, and you see here the manuscript of the very, very first, let's call it data conference in architecture, uh, with a wonderful title, Architecture and the Computer. It's still an unknown territory, right? So let's call it the computer. And Christoph Alexander was there as a panelist, um, 64. So he was around um, in, in the mid-30s. And he was quite critical, by the way, um, concerning data. And I want to share with you, um, you can see here Christoph Alexander next to him, I think, uh, Chamayev, uh, back then, uh, I think, Dean of GSD. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but um, uh, he was, a, uh, of course, a leading uh, influential figure in, in East Coast. And you can also see the topic of the panel, Christopher Alexander was uh, into it, computers and creativity. So it's not that far away, right? And of course, you ask yourself, like, okay, this is 64, now 22, still talking about creativity, still talking about should we involve the computer, and if yes, you know, what are the limitations, what is design, um, all these things, in a sense, uh, is part of architecture history. That's the message, right? And the message of Alexander um, to the audience, um, I, I will read it for you, no worries, but I think <clears throat> it's, it's quite interesting to, to share with you. So, Christoph Alexander, um, is talking 64 at the very first conference about design and, and, uh, 
and data and computation. So, quote, in my opinion, the question all these questioners ask, namely, how can the computer be applied to architectural design, is misguided, dangerous, and foolish. We do not spend time writing letters to one another and talking about the question, how can the slide rule be applied to architectural design? We do not wonder about our houses, hammer or saw in hand, wondering where we can apply them. In short, adults use tools to solve problems that they cannot solve without help. Only a child to whom the world of tools is more exciting than the world in which those tools can be applied wonders about wondering how to make use of his tools. Wonderful part of his uh, statement, I think. This will, of course, not be worth saying if there were hundreds of significant problems which the computer could help us solve. But there are not. A digital computer is essentially the same as a huge army of clerks, equipped with rule books, pencil and paper, all stupid and entirely without initiative, but able to follow exactly millions of precisely defined operations. There is nothing a computer can do with such an army of clerks could not do if given time. Quote end. So, <clears throat> my first question, of course, Leo, is for you. You are the tooling head of MVIDV. What would you say to Christopher Alexander today? And how would you explain your work to him? Uh, first, I need a quick um, clarification. I'm, I'm not the head of the group. That's uh, now my co-founder, Sander van der Borg, just, uh, uh, just to get it out there. Um, what I would say to Christopher Alexander today, can, sorry, can you just uh, specify a little bit in, in which context in regards to... I know, I know that, you are, that you are responsible for building and developing new tools mm -hmm. for architectural design. Now Christopher Alexander says to you, Leo, I'm sorry, I have to say, it's just, you know, for kids. Please go outside and solve problems and don't play with the tools. So what is your answer? I mean, I think that that's what we're doing, and this is probably the reason why we uh, founded such a research group within an architectural practice and not as a standalone or external consulting company. So I think that uh, at the core of what we're doing is a very direct relation between solving a pros uh, uh, problems or exploring, defining problems uh, in the moment of making tools. That's, uh, I think the, this kind of simultaneity of addressing the problem and building the tool for that tool, I think, is uh, for that problem is a uh, key of how we work. You so, would disagree uh, with him. Yeah, I think so. Yes, I mean, I, so, I mean, on the part of being a kid that's more excited <laughs> looking at the tools than at the problem, certainly. Yeah. Matilda, you would disagree as well. He says yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think he's he's not uh, far off in the sense that, um, in some way, uh, I guess what's difficult about today is the amount of data that we have now so the amount of clerks that we would need and therefore the computer to some extent or the capacity to compute information becomes essential um, because the level of complexity that we're dealing with in, in contemporary society or the level of information that we capture also because we all carry around mobile devices we all produce great quantities of, of digital information um, i think that you know, he's, he's not far off, but in the sense that the level of complexity is so high now. Um, I think it's interesting that he, he asks, you know, so it's not about asking what can the computer bring to design, but what are the problems in some way um, that we know in design that could be solved by such an army of clerks. Um, and I think that these, I guess, in some way, we're in a kind of snowball effect because with the higher amount of data that we produce, we also <laughs> produce information on more and more problems to some extent. So I guess the question is, where does it stop maybe? Or how far does it go? Um, Leo, um, can you describe a, a bit generally 
uh, what is the importance of tools for design? Um, well, concretely, in, in, in our case, it's uh, mainly, I guess, looking at workflows within our practice, within MBRDV, um, really ranging from early concept design, from sketching, from foam making, from massing studies, from grasping a design context, doing an anal analysis of, of that, all the way up to execution and uh, the deli delivery of uh, construction documents. And I guess what we've been doing over the last six years mainly is analyzing this, breaking it down into small chunks, looking and uh, also looking at it, of course, in different contexts, which I think is um, maybe a key point, I guess, for any form of digital tools is the geographical and cultural context in which you embed them. So as MBRDB is operating globally, we do build design tools for European contexts, but already if you operate in China, of course, this works very different, mainly also due to data scarcity and um, geopolitical um, challenges. So I guess um, the main point that we've been doing is analyzing this and building very small, almost more like plugins, hacks, extensions for very specific problems within these workflows. Uh, and therefore, I guess one of the key ambitions is to increase uh, speed, automation. It's a large machine that we operate in. And on the other hand, of course, accuracy. That's, uh, I guess, on the practical side, that's the part that has been justifying, I guess, our existence within the firm, and also um, for us to grow it up to, I think we're six people full-time at this point. Of course, we also try to look at it from the other side, and uh, maybe more through speculative lenses, and also through um, looking at what kind of tools do we want to make, what do we want to, um, how do we want to design, right? Like, because I guess the first part that I described now is more kind of problem solving and logical deduction where almost existing processes determine the tools that we build. But of course, we try to also look at it from the other side and the more experimental side and well, I guess like how do we want to design what is needed for Regulation is the right keyword. Um, um, Matilde, can you give me three terms um, that you think will be important in the future um, for the relationship between design and AI? Design and AI? I think this is the topic today. Three, three terms. Um, uh, well, disruption, cognition. Cognition. Yeah, cognitive capacity. Yeah. Um, and do you want to help about it? <laughs> Which one? Which one? I want to think about the third one. Leo, do you have the last one? Uh, maybe collaboration, maybe. Collaboration. Okay, Sarah. Um, you are um, you are not a trained architect. You are coming from computer science to us, so we have a real expert here. Now we have three terms about the future of design and AI: Dis disruptive collaboration and cognition. Right? Um, could you comment a bit on the three terms from your perspective? Uh, well. I have to know uh, in what context uh, you put this. Uh, so, for example, the cognition, what do you mean? Is it like a design cognition? Is a separate kind of cognition, for example, that you need to design? Or is it within the same that we uh, perceive it as all human basically does have uh, these properties? Can I, can I hear your answer on both? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so there are two levels basically. So there, this expect uh, expert cognition and the one that we all as a human share. Um, and would it be like the next uh, frontier for AI in design? That was uh, your uh, question, Georg, right? Yeah, I, I mean we have. I think Leo said yeah, it's about also about speculation in design. So we want to speculate a bit, and now we have three terms which could be like the, the play field for, uh, for the discussion, but also maybe uh, for, for uh, a future discussion, how to relate design to AI, uh, disruption, cognition, and, uh, and collaboration. Um, and still the question, Seron, from your perspective, comment on these three terms a bit. Um, um, also from AI perspective, for example, uh, um, collaborative AI, tools or methods or models, um, cognitive-based um, methods. Um, disruption, I think that's an interesting, quite complex term. I would be curious to know more about this, uh, Saron, but feel free to speculate. Yeah, th this is actually very interesting. Um, 
well, uh, I'm coming from the discipline of computer vision, which actually uh, looks at how uh, people perceive uh, visual data and how can we mimic this in the artificial sense, right? So how artificial intelligence can do that. And uh, architecture is by nature, by nature very visual, right? So the, most of the communications between the designers actually pass through visuals and uh, they ter try to communicate by uh, modeling buildings uh, uh, within different forms and, and different tools actually. Uh, and, and designers have this ability to perceive these visuals, right? Um, this is somehow very special and uh, like expert skills. So not everyone can make sense of a floor plan, for example, right? So this is a form of cognition that we are talking about, uh, architecture cognition, not uh, general uh, cognition. Uh, and actually to make sense of all these data that are uh, created and generated by architecture, uh, we need AI models and, and intelligent tools that can uh, basically perceive these visuals within the same level as an architect. I mean, the end goal that would be, so that we can actually categorize and uh, transfer all these data that is scattered around uh, uh, us into useful information for architects so that they can make a uh, decision based on what data can offer. So I think cognition, if we, well, relate that to cognition, I would say yes, that's exactly what uh, uh, the, the next generation of AI would be busy with, which is a very difficult task indeed. Um, and it's, it's very interesting because I think everyone is so fascinated with um, something that um, AI can do so far if you ask public, maybe they give examples of, uh, for example, uh, AI beating uh, our um, human champion in chess or AlphaGo or these kind of games. Uh, and still, if you compare it with uh, the cognitive abilities that we have as human, uh, I would say it's quite laughable. I mean, a toddler could describe this scene uh, very naturally, I would say. A uh, toddler could just start speaking, right? Our computer vision models are still quite blind in that sense. So uh, there are very different levels. So there are uh, these very, uh, I would say, specific tasks that we could automize it, I think, with a uh, faster pace, I would say, and that would come maybe in a very near future, like um, in, in five years or so. And then we have these generic tasks that require really a um, combination of, uh, you know, uh, human intelligence that it takes, um, seems to take forever. I think it's very interesting with the text that uh, Georg showed. It was around the same time, uh, 60s, that Minsky actually at MIT um, ask students to solve computer vision within a summer project. And in many interviews, he mentioned that within next generation, we would, we would have um, general artificial intelligence with the same level as humans. Uh, we still far, far from that point. So there were very optimistic people at the time that would promise things, well, which led to somehow AI winter, that they call it, and, well, critical point of view on what computers can do. This is interesting. It's interesting, uh, Sarah, that you mentioned Minsky, because Minsky was also at the conference. Oh, okay. I <laughs> didn't know that. I chose, of course, Christopher Alexander to, you know, let everybody know that he was a quite interesting um, figure in, uh, in between the disciplines. You mentioned um, optimistic view of Minsky. How important is optimism um, today when it comes about, you know, on communication of technology or AI models? How, how important is it for you to, to represent an optimistic face of AI? Well, I think as basically universities, 
Well, we, are, uh, we have to be critical about what could come with a new technology, right? So, but that doesn't mean that we uh, have to criticize everything without uh, pointing to the things that needs to be changed and fixed. And it's like pure criticism. It's not uh, what, well, it's not constructive, right? So I think we need this sort of optimism because, well, we, we need to cope up with the new condition and it's better that we have, uh, we act on it uh, as soon as possible, right? And then for that, we need to um, familiarize ourselves with, with the topic a bit, because if we don't know what is this and then how is working basically, it would be very difficult to be an active player. And I think um, being optimistic here actually would be a fuel to participate, to contribute uh, to the field in different, uh, let's say, domains and disciplines uh, so that we have a responsible type of AI that are tuned to uh, human values and our uh, discipline values rather than business matrix because that's what is quite happening when the most of the research are a bit hijacked by big uh, companies. I don't say that they are bad or they have bad missions or so, just for the sake of optimistic, uh, being optimistic. But um, it's important at the same time to uh, tune the research outcomes to something which is more uh, generic to the human faith uh, and what we think is important and ethical. Uh, and I think universities would be maybe naturally the best place to pursue that. So we need to remain optimistic. Um, <clears throat> Follow-up question, Siran. Um, I think that's a very important point right now, like the, 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 the challenge to be optimistic when it comes about, um, you know, on technology. This is not that, that easy. But of course, it's super easy to be critical at the first uh, step, you know, and just say, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, yeah, something called AI. But on the other hand, of course, there's also a kind of a com communication bug because Talking about AI, and even on the panel here, we create a kind of agency. We, we say AI can do this or AI can do that. So talking about tools, agency, and also the AI, I think it's also the communication which brought us somehow into the corner of the debate where you always have to argue, you know, no, I'm doing research with AI. I'm not, you know, uh, programming a drone or whatever. So I think that's a kind of a topic which is on the communication level. But I have another question, Siren. Um, when it comes to research, and I think you are right, the optimistic way of, of, of dealing with technology um, could be academia, right? Um, and of course, we know right now at the moment, kind of, yeah, we are experiencing a kind of hype um, concerning AI. Let's call it a bubble, an AI bubble. Um, especially here, you know, in academia, the sciences, um, Theo Delft, for example, um, um, we have now over, I think you know it better than me, 30 new AI labs uh, at, uh, at Theo Delft. And it's interesting to see, you know, 30 AI labs, <laughs> um, what are they doing? So, and it's interesting that, that they are always in um, combination or connection with another discipline. So we have AI and health, AI and mobility. AI and ethics, um, AI and exhibitions, Javier, um, AI and water management. So we are part now of a huge combina combination game, combining AI plus something, right? Now you are here at BK, so AI plus design. Interesting, right? Um, so my question is, Aaron, what makes design so special? Um, compared to, to the other disciplines? What is the challenge from the AI perspective um, talking about design? Um, I would say it's a complex nature. You uh, need to combine many, uh, let's say, um, skills to be able to an analyze and then synthesize something, which is very high level of intelligence, I would say. And so far, that was not possible with, uh, well, our um, kind of primitive, uh, let's say, AI models that would, uh, yeah, 
focus on uh, recognizing cats from dogs, for example. That's not what we want to solve here. Uh, this is much more into it. Uh, so I think that's what also fascinates me because, um, yeah, this is a um, real challenge for a computer scientist to solve. Uh, how to make sense of all these kind of uh, multifaceted data and how to automate the whole process in a sense. Uh, that's, I think, the next level and this is a right place to, to test this idea, I would say. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, it, 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 I think there were like more disciplines that uh, they were more ready uh, in a sense. So, um, for example, I would say uh, in um, medical imaging, for example, those uh, tasks were very specific and um, it was quite easy to start with it in the image processing era, even before the computer vision. But uh, now I think um, it, it's a different, uh, let's say, playground. Um, another aspect would be uh, the, the human factor, right? So the subjectivity, it's not, um, two plus two math, it's, uh, there are subjective views on things. And there are so many things that has to be evaluated to, for a design to, to validate, right? So I think this subjectivity is something which is quite uh, difficult for um, current AI models to handle. Um, with, um, again, the cat and dog example would be easy to uh, ask many workers to label images of cats and dogs and train a model uh, that can do the same. However, uh, recognizing different functionalities of a building, typologies, uh, I don't know, the, the quality of the design, um, how can you connect all these aspects into the, uh, let's say, geographical, uh, let's say, bed where that, that building actually exists, all these things, uh, there are subjective views on this. Different people have different opinions. How do we handle opinions when training computers? Um, how do we collect all this data, right? We have to ask then many people for only one sample to validate that as, a, uh, as, as inclusive as possible. Otherwise, we would be, the bias would be too much towards, uh, towards one opinion. And that's uh, what makes it incompatible. If we want to make such an AI model, we need to um, research the data collection model for the architecture, uh, model the visuals that are, I'm talking about uh, computer vision, of course, but uh, um, the visuals that are generated by uh, architects and how do we manage all this data? How do we make it machine readable and uh, machine learnable? Uh, all these aspects needs to be, uh, I would say, investigated. Very nice. Making sense of things, you know, making sense of data. I think uh, that's a very interesting uh, aspect for you, Jaron. I, th I thought art artists are responsible for making sense, you know, for us. What do you think? Now it's the AI. Artists are responsible for making sense. I, I wouldn't know if that's the case. I, I think researchers are here for, for to make sense of stuff. It's artists who pose more questions or, or try to inspire or provoke or um, but making sense. I don't know about that one. Let's let's say posing creating questions, right? Um, you are dealing with AI methods and algorithms for a long time right now. Um, this is the reason why um, you are here on, on the panel. Um, Seran is, let's say, specialized on visual data, right? Um, computer vision. Now, um, could you explain us a bit your last um, piece of art um, dealing with text? So text-based AI um, artwork. And could you explain also a bit um, what is the question of this piece of art, if you say you are creating questions? Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, one of the uh, yeah, most prominent examples is a project that I've been working on uh, for the past two years, uh, together with uh, an acquaintance of mine, Peter van der Putten. He's uh, associated with uh, Leiden University of the Media and Technology Department there. 
what we worked on there was to use uh, text generation AI, actually, uh, so GPT-3, uh, one of the strongest models still, I guess, to generate uh, text, one of the biggest models, so it's really create this really fascinating human-like uh, textual content. Can you explain the machine a bit, GPT-3? GPT-3 is basically a system, they call it uh, large uh, language models, and the difference between, uh, you know, text generation AI from a couple of a couple of years ago would be that, uh, well, for example, a couple of years ago, I created an art piece uh, about Nietzsche, and I used text generation AI to, to let the system create new lines of text as if they were written by uh, Nietzsche. And what you would do then is actually take a couple of books of Nietzsche, or maybe a lot of books he wrote, and then put them all in the system, train the system on it, and then it would be capable of actually generating stuff that's, well, you could imagine it to be like uh, something Nietzsche might have written. written. Now, GPT-3 is a large language model, and the process there is a little bit different. So they already train it on this huge volume of textual data. So it's basically the exact sources are not uh, public, but it's basically said that it's more or less trained on this volume of text, like uh, a volume like the whole textual internet. So the interesting uh, stuff there, what you can do with that, uh, that's a lot of text, I can tell you. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> what you get interesting uh, stuff you can do with it then is actually give it really specific assignments. So without training a specific model, actually giving it really specific assignments. So you could uh, ask the system, uh, write me a song, uh, lyric text, like if it was written by uh, Kanye West or Kanye or Jay, I think you have to call him today. Or you could ask the system, uh, give me a description of the physical health of a cat, for example. <laughs> Fantastic <laughs> brief, design brief. But what we worked on was uh, actually uh, creating a system, uh, which uh, or a, a GPT-3 based uh, setup, creating a setup that would um, enable through AI uh, the participation of nature in the societal debate about uh, climate change. And it's a project uh, called uh, Letters from Nature. And what we did uh, there, so what the system is actually doing, it's writing letters on behalf of nature to world uh, leaders, uh, complaining and asking for help about uh, uh, climate change. So what, is, what does it mean concrete? Well, for example, uh, the system, uh, you can give GPT-3 really specific assignments like, write a letter from a melting ice cap to a president. That's the most simple example. And because it has this huge volume of data behind it, it can actually give a prediction on textual content that you would, yeah, could imagine to be textual content like a melting ice cap might write to a president. So the letter would have text in it like, uh, please help me, I'm a uh, melting ice cap, I'm dying, I'm in pain, uh, please uh, uh, yeah, give me a hand, uh, do something, uh, stop the conservatives, etc. That's the kind of content you can uh, think about, and that it's, you can tweak the system in all sorts of ways, because you could also ask it to write an angry letter, for example, or write a letter in panic, or uh, write a more poetic uh, uh, letter. So we're basically exploring there the whole um, yeah, psychology, you might call it, of the melting ice cap. And it's a whole creative method on its own that's really developing there. Because you could really you could see it a little bit like cooking. So for example, I could give it uh, um, uh, an assignment like write a letter uh, from a melting ice cap to a president. But I could already prime the system also with a piece of, uh, well, for example, a poem, like a cool poem. And then you would actually see the style of the poem actually coming uh, forward in, in that generated uh, piece of text. So it has this kind of poetic feel, uh, more abstract feel to it. So, but you don't know if the president uses also GPT-3 to reply to you. Uh, unfortunately, we send out the letters to, to the whole, uh, yeah, the, to the whole world. There were several installations also where people could uh, send out postcards in several museums to a president who never received any replies. So, so I think they don't have GPT-3. That must be it. <laughs> so, I mean, this is the, a, a different way of dealing with subjectivity. Eh? I was thinking on 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 the subjectivity question you um, you mentioned, but I think it's also about emotions or about aesthetics, or about beauty, maybe. I know that you are a trained data scientist. And um, the question of, of beauty, it's a very sticky question, of course, but let's say the aesthetic field of, you know, talking about 
beauty. What is the relation between data science and, and beauty? Yeah, beauty is of course a very broad uh, well, theme. I can see. I can see. Poetic questions and, I can and see. Letters. Yeah, I can see already beauty and art already also in the development of an algorithm to some extent. So yes. there's beauty in the simplicity of a formula. And there's beauty in. So there's beauty in data science. My preference would go to more artistic uh, beauty, so more visual or poetic beauty, which. I don't know, it's kind of, it's, it's different at some level. It, it touches something deeper than purely, in my opinion, than purely the, the, the beauty of a mathematical formula, for example. Um, Matilda, you, you, are, you are dealing um, also with all kind of aesthetics, uh, and, but from a different perspective, right? More from fabrication, let's say, or the ecological, um, um, or you say, um, yeah, computational design point of view. Um, we have now the, the idea of nature uh, on the table, letters from nature. Um, and you, you also work, let's say, yeah, in the interface of, of design, digital culture and ecology, which I think which is super exciting, uh, uh, promising field. And you focus on something um, you call ecological modeling um, and also ecosystem services. What is that? What are ecosystem services? Um, they're services provided by ecosystems within our urban environment, which can be, um, for example, procurement, uh, regulation. Um, so, for example, if we pick an apple off a tree, we are procuring um, food. Um, regulation, so, for example, the management of heat island, urban heat island effect can be done through sort of vegetative strategies or ecological strategies within the urban environment. Um, and so the idea is to sort of work in a framework where we can provide cities with multiple ecosystem services. Um, and so in some way, um, what we're trying to do is a little bit, uh, one of the things we're trying to do um, is shift a little bit the perspective of design um, from a purely sort of anthropogenic one to a more inclusive one, um, including, for example, ecological necessities within the design process. So um, I, in this sense, uh, the work that we do is more on the urban scale, although obviously the, the sort of like actuation can be, can be done through a variety of different scales, so obviously material scale um, all the way through to the urban scale. Uh, but what we're looking at is understanding how we can in some way measure ecological connectivity because we have um, very fragmented territories um, at the moment. And so how we can measure the current ecological tech to, um, connectivity, sorry, um, and through circuits, circuit uh, theory or the application of circuit theory uh, within design, um, understand how through the, let's say, changing of a series of different uh, elements within the urban environment, we can enhance that connectivity. So in some way, create a, a higher uh, polarity between different nodes. Um, and, and with that idea, uh, we in some way design not only from the perspective of the, the, anthro or the people, um, but also from the perspective of uh, the animals and the plants um, from an ecological perspective. And um, what so is... Can I just say something? Of course. Do you know Client Earth? Client Earth? No, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> sorry, I wanted to say, they're, they're a law firm that defend the Earth. You should get in touch. <laughs> oh, nice, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's so, so maybe, many stuff maybe also. Maybe your letters will be interesting to them. <laughs> There's many stuff uh, happening on the legal front, so it's yeah, very yeah. interesting, of course, you know, with the, 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 the river in New Zealand uh, that uh, gained the uh, rights, actually, in there. And, uh, so it's really interesting and uh, developments uh, on that field, yeah. That's an interesting opportunity of how art then can also go into the world of policy to some extent or into those. Yeah. You have to write a letter to Matilda. Huh? You have to write a letter to Matilda yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to, to connect you. Um, but Matilda, you you ma you mentioned disruption. Yes. Um, you know, what is the relation between disruption, design, and data in your field? I mean, there are many relations. I I mentioned disruption because I think that 
all technologies in some way bring a disruption. So um, if we're talking about AI and design, and you were saying that the architect is moving towards the role of a curator, there is a disruption in our discipline to some extent. So how we actuate within our discipline. Um, there's also a disruption in the type of tools that we would be using uh, to sort of approach our discipline. And there's also a disruption in the way in which we would interact with space, no? So um, in some way, it's, it's got multiple levels of disruption. And disruption doesn't mean a negative thing. Eh? It's just a change. Um, I think that before you were saying something about um, sort of this, um, we have the question of optimism and then we have the question of being critical. And, and I couldn't agree more. We need to be optimists. Um, and I think design in some way is inherently optimist, no? Because we're, we're projecting towards the future, no? We're, we're trying to create shapes for something that hopefully <laughs> we would like to, um, to, to be within, no? Um, and, and I think that there, uh, the critical aspect is actually, for me, also really important because we always need to see, you know, like every technological step, you invent the plane, you invent the plane crash, no? So what is the plane crash in these scenarios? So we need to be critical in some way and try and have a view, and it's, it's impossible to foresee all of the plane crashes that will come, um, but I think being critical is, is really important. Uh, what worries me more, maybe, is, is the question of fear. No? So um, I've, I've been in, in many situations where people have said to me, you know, like, I don't like technology. Um, but they have, obviously, a phone, an iPad. They, they ride a bike, but it's a titanium, sort of like a super, super fancy bike that obviously wouldn't exist without technology. So I think that in some way, um, AI is, is even more complex in that sense because we don't really understand fully or we don't have a full grasp of what it can or what it could potentially do. Um, do in positive and obviously then there's, there's a negative side. Um, so for me in some way the, the optimism in design is really important with a critical eye. Um, and then maybe what, what I would be weary of is, is the fear, no? And I think how I think it's super difficult today to be critical, you know, when it comes to data and AI, what does it mean, critical thinking? I mean, it's like, of course, we are in academia, but the question is, do we need new tools to even be critical? Well, that's a big one. Um, so it's, it's difficult to be critical, but in some way, well, we're in an academic environment and in some way, Research is creating sort of or asking questions, um, so it is per se critical. No, um, what did you say before? Yeah, you want to help Matilda a bit? No, no, no. I just can't remember what you said before. I want to say something else. Do we need new tools to be uh, critical in the age of AI? Okay, so sorry, I, I had a, a mind blank. Um, so I don't. I don't think we necessarily need new tools, but what is what is the difficulty, in my opinion, is the, the capacity to navigate this information, no? because we are in everyday life, sort of um, in a context where we get a lot of information. So first and foremost, what is the fake news? No? So um, for example, I was reading an article on the BBC News the other day um, that was sort of pointing out what are all the fake news in the, the war against in, in Ukraine, no? So even newspapers now have to publish articles on what is fake news. And then obviously you ask yourself the question, well, are they telling me the real news or is it the fake news or, you know? So I don't know if we need new tools, um, but what we do need is to actively engage and understand, you know, where does this information come from? Um, and that's in like from sort of reading papers to really understanding, you know, where where is this information coming from? What is the perspective this information is coming from also? Because obviously different disciplines have different approaches to the same question often, no? Um, so in that sense, we also need to understand what we can contribute. So critically looking at ourselves and what we can contribute to the the, the situation that we have in front of us, whatever that may be. I think that's a very crucial thing because in the end, um, it's about trust, right? And the question, of course, is how can we be critical in a system without trust? 
So it's a big question, of course, but I think that's a quite interesting um, debate for an next panel, maybe, let's see, um, about data and trust or um, trust in technology in the age of AI. Um, you mentioned the uh, the fake news. Maybe one last question, uh, Matilda. You in in your institution or oh, your institution in, in Barcelona, your lab, um, um, uh, called itself like platform for the exchange of knowledge. Mm -hmm. I found this on on the web. It's an official official text, um, and of course, um, I'm interested in, in in the idea of knowledge. Right? What a platform is? I would say, okay, check. We're in the age of platforms or platform capitalism or whatever. Um, but the question of is, 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 no, is about knowledge, right? What kind of knowledge do we need to design in the age of, of data? And what kind of knowledge do you mean if you say we are a platform for exchange of knowledge? Okay. Um, well, what kind of knowledge do we need? We need a variety of types of knowledge. I mean, there's on one side, it, Again, maybe I'll go back to what I was saying before. I can tell you this from my perspective, and I'm an architect, but I have always worked, let's say, more on the urban scale. Um, so my perspective is a design perspective. Um, but what I can tell you is that we need to have an understanding of the panorama of tools that are out there um, to be able to ensure that we are, like, First, maybe using the right ones, um, but in some way also to be able to engage with a technology that enhances what we what we are doing, no? In some way, so allows us to respond um, to the context that we're working with. Um, knowledge is, in some way, uh, you know, we're all in, in research, we're all in a voyage of discovery, no? So knowledge is what we produce from that voyage. Um, and I think that one of the important ways to in some way validate and, and consolidate knowledge is to confront with other people who are working in similar fields or different fields to be able to have a dialogue and then in some way grow on that knowledge, no? So in that sense, the platform for knowledge is in some way a space for discussion so that we can, we, all of us, can come together and build the knowledge that we need to deal with whatever is to come. I don't know if that answers your I like the idea of, of working on a panorama of tools. Um, that sounds like creating or generating a, a, a kind of navigational view on, on data and also on, on tools, and I think that's that's definitely um, one of the key, yeah, let's call it skills for the future. Would you say that's, that's a future skill for designers to, to know how to navigate in this or through this panorama of tools? And for that, critical thinking is essential. Yes. <laughs> um, Henriette, um, now um, I have to be a bit provocative right now to entertain the audience, but I think... Um, you, you, you have a huge experience in, in robotics and design fabrication, um, trying to bridge the gap between design and technology by using the robot, right, as a mediator, let's say, um, and also um, to create a story, uh, which is like, okay, um, designer or architect and product, let's call it a building, are disconnected. So design process and publication process are dis disconnected. And now we have the robots or the fabrication tools, human robot inter machine interaction, which we can use to bridge the gap. And that would mean that we have a new role for the architect. Would you agree with this? Definitely, I would agree with that. Um, basically, we link design with uh, robotic production and operation, meaning that the architect is uh, empowered. So we are not only, let's say, um, I, I would say not only envision, because you were talking about envisioning uh, what we want to do, but we can do things now. So uh, this is our experience also with students that uh, after 
they go through a process of uh, being educated in designed robotic production and operation, they, they end up establishing startups. And they, indeed, they don't go the traditional, uh, let's say, uh, way of becoming an architect, but um, they uh, feel more empowered to um, practice they, they're actually um, architecture uh, without basically following the traditional way. So <laughs> this is what we are very much interested in and, and we believe that uh, this is something that we would need to consider when we uh, educate architects for the 21st century. Um, in particular, from the perspective that uh, we know that 50% of all tasks are going to be automated, 45% uh, are going to be human-robot interaction uh, supported, and only 5% remains in human hands. So for us, the question is, okay, so what, what is going to be automated? What is going to be uh, uh, human-robot uh, interaction supported? And what remains in human hands? So um, we explored that more recently with, with actually with Seyran and with a couple of colleagues from um, Cognitive Robotics with Masters two students, um, but also in, in several projects where uh, the question of human-robot interaction in relationship to automation is, is, uh, becomes extremely important. But I mean, have the last 20 years, or let's say 30 years, um, or 20 years, um, shown that this, this belief, you say I believe, so this belief and also this hope um, has been hijacked by industry, by the construction industry, question. Um, so we can say, um, and it's a provocation, uh, Henrietta, for you. Um, but of course, I mean, if you, if you see the landscape of robotic labs worldwide, um, and of course, it's like you have to disagree with me, but we are still producing pavilions, let's say, and, and models for exhibitions, for uh, art biennials, while out there, um, you know, the construction industry is building buildings using robots. So what's the difference? What's the motivation for us to still believe in robotics? Well, um, as, as I was mentioning before, knowing that actually 50% of all tasks are going to aut be automated. Uh, I think the challenge for us now is indeed to identify what can be automated versus uh, what results from human-robot interaction. So um, the question of how fast this takes place, going also back to, to what you're mentioning and also what you were mentioning at the very beginning. So in the sense that if we look back at the 70s, of course, we see that, um, let's say, the projection for the future, in the sense that I was thinking that we would develop much faster, just put it in simple terms. So um, I, I also, let's say, go through, through these phases of development, but I do believe that at this moment we are far enough to make the next step. And, uh, but, from my perspective, at least, the bin industry is very slow in picking up these developments, unfortunately. It's the other way around. You would say industry is slow and academia is From my perspective, ahead yes, of. definitely. So. Do, you, do you think that um, this kind of um, human-machine interaction or the field of robotics um, needs a new narrative for the 21st century, or can we still use the narrative from the 70s or 60s saying, yeah, we can, we, can, we can empower the architect. This is like the master narrative. Um, but do we need an, a new narrative? I do think uh, that we get a new narrative. <clears throat> um, the, I think that the main difference, at least from my perspective, is that, um, yes, the architect is empowered, but, but uh, the architect s starts to share let's say, um, agency with non-human agents. So the creation of, of architecture and of 
buildings is not anymore uh, only human driven, but it's basically a, a combination between uh, artificial and, and uh, human agents. And can you briefly uh, let the audience know what about experimentation or the experiment? Um, if you, uh, how important is the idea of doing experiments um, with design and technology to yeah, navigate um, and explore the, the in-between field? Uh, from my point of view, it's, it's extremely important. So basically, our projects are, are very much experimental. Uh, from our point of view, um, finding out basically what, what the technology uh, can do for you. So instead of, let's say, um, trying to... If, if you can draft something with a pen, just do it. Uh, don't try to use other technologies if, if certain technologies are just better. So this is why for me also the question of when to use AI or if using AI um, is, is necessary or in which processes we do that, uh, it's important. So, and this is why I think experimentation plays an important role if you basically really focus on what the technology can offer you. So I think often the, perhaps the, the question with respect to what we are doing is that why, why do we choose a certain formal language or what's the what's re relevance of, is this art, is this architecture, what it is? So, uh, but I think finding out indeed what, what um, you can do with the new technology is extremely important and use it and basically use it in the right way. So, um, talking about experiments, I think we should, uh, we should do a, a small experiment right now and I would invite you uh, for a quick speed round um, on, on the following questions and, and topics. And I would like to ask each of you um, to comment on the, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the topic. So, first one, um, Leo, what is design data literacy in the age of AI? Just think out loud. I guess it's uh, an awareness of different formats, sources, so, so it has to do with credibility, with um, contextuality, so what I was talking about earlier, in, in which con geographical context, in which political context you operate, and uh, I guess also with the uh, translation of data formats. Matilda. You want to comment on this, Henriette? I think um, it's, it's very important to have uh, data literacy in, in this age. And um, I find out while working together with uh, computer scientists, roboticists, that um, there's a lot of work to do to get, let's say, to have some level of literacy. So, um, that's my comment. So we okay, have to hurry up. We're, we're I, mean, to do I, I can explain Twitter. why yeah. I skipped. Um, because I understand des data literacy, but design data literacy? Yes. Or is it the data literacy relative to the design discipline? Very good discipline? observation, Matilda. Sorry? It's not the data literacy we know. It's the design data literacy. And I think that's, that's maybe, you, you talk about the panorama of, of tools, yeah. about navigating the, the landscape of tools, and I think that could be something what we would call design data literacy. Okay, well then I think there as well, I mean, to, on one side to be literate in data-driven design is obviously to know the tools, um, but as Henrietta was saying before, um, you know, it's not about applying the technology just because we can apply the technology, it's about critically understanding where the technology can in some way be useful to allow us to go further than we would if we didn't have the technology, no? So... Okay, next one. Um, Jaron, what is storytelling with AI in architecture for you? Storytelling with AI in architecture? Well, I guess, uh, although I'm not really involved in architecture, uh, most of my artworks are also kind of stories that you tell, for example, speculations about futures. So, 
storytelling uh, with AI in architecture could be it could be about all sorts of stories. So it could be about speculative designs in architecture. It could be really about <laughs> nature and people together through AI uh, designing buildings, etc. Yeah. Seran, storytelling with AI. <laughs> yeah, storytelling to me is uh, putting abstract things in context. So. Uh, I think storytelling with AI in architecture is using an AI to, again, make sense of data and put it into the context of architecture. Wonderful story. Thanks. Leo, data versus information versus knowledge. I don't want to skip that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Who wants to help him? I, but what, are we supposed to say what they are, or...? Whatever you want. Well, I mean, data is yes. the raw material. Information is when you combine it in some way and use it. And knowledge is what you produce out of that process, I hope. <laughs> Would you agree, Leo? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, uh, I guess it's a kind of maybe a chain of making sense of it uh, yes. uh, as a raw pool of, inf of data, which can be clustered or categorized into information, which then can be at some point formalized or agreed on also culturally as knowledge. Would you, would you agree that there's one term which cannot be capitalized? Cannot be capitalized. By industry or business. So data, data is capital, information is capital. What about knowledge? It's capitalizable, yeah, yeah. So if you are a platform for exchanging knowledge, you, are, you can be capitalized. That's disruption, Matilda. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would disagree um, with. Uh, I, I think knowledge is not uh, is not a capital which cannot be capitalized. I think information, yes, data, yes, but knowledge is this kind of space we are creating here, this debating uh, and and discussing. So I would say uh, maybe we have we can create a platform for you know exchanging knowledge, but knowledge itself, I think. Uh, is is something which is not uh, part of capital. Um, yes, um, I think knowledge definitely was um, capitalized earlier. So we move more and more towards open, let's say, knowledge sharing, or at least that's uh, that's the goal. So uh, and there are many platforms. So for instance, we couldn't if I if I look back. At, at the technology that we have been using some time ago, uh, and I look at what happens now in the sense that, for instance, uh, Rhino and the plugins and the possibility to customize your own software. This was not possible uh, a while ago. When I did my PhD, I worked actually with computer scientists together to get to some result. Uh, nowadays, we, are, we, we have basically access to this, to this uh, knowledge and we co-develop the no knowledge. So definitely, we, I agree with you when you say that, that uh, we move towards decapitalizing, I'm calling it now, uh, knowledge. But um, we are not that so far. If you look at AutoCAD, if you look at et cetera, et cetera, you're going to see that... Um, AutoCAD is a tool, huh, Leo? It's not, it's not knowledge. That's another panel. That's another panel. <laughs> but I would still disagree to just entertain a bit um, the... Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just... Hello. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that I, I agree in an ideal world, knowledge shouldn't be capitalizable. But then there is direct capitalization there's no pro there's no product. and indirect. So right. even what we say here... Yeah. <laughs> So there's no, pro and there's a, it's a never ending story. Generating knowledge is, there's an endless uh, debate, literally. So I think to capitalize knowledge, you need a product somehow, um, which, is, which is maybe not possible. But let's, you know, let's keep it like this. Mm -hmm. um, problem solving versus speculation. Seran. Well, this is a difficult one. Um, I think a speculation is more related to intuition. Uh, something that we, when we accumulate knowledge, we have uh, some intuition, 
when we are dealing with or facing with problems. Uh, and that's basically the seed for problem solving. Problem solving is uh, more of a process of approaching uh, the goal of solving the problem. We need a problem. Matilda. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess problem solving put on the table presumes that there is a possible solution. No? Um, I think that in design, we use speculation as a design tool to actually do the process of problem solving. So in some way, push some specific type of information to an extreme to look at what would happen if we continued in one particular way to identify maybe what are the most critical issues and they are the first ones that we want to deal with within the problem solving context. Yeah. Um, so I think that in, in design, in some way they're used uh, together. No, and I guess, Henriette, do you also like, when you're, when you're and, and we do the same, when we're doing the prototyping and the testing of different sort of processes um, within the lab, it's a little bit understanding, you know, speculating, well, could we do this? And then you understand that maybe that, that isn't the ideal scenario for the problem solving, or that's a really good scenario for the problem solving, no? Data generalist versus data specialist, Jerome. And ask me, ask me please, not what does it mean? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm for, responsible for the question. <laughs> now, of course, well, we're heading towards more uh, importance of data generalists, of course. So uh, the whole specialist, uh, yeah, I don't really believe in this. It's real, the future will be about uh, data generalists. So we're <laughs> able to have the full view and to do uh, general stuff with data. Leo, data specialist, data generalist. I might have was still in the previous one. I think the... Um, yeah, probably the, the trend is more towards general uh, concepts and understandings. Also, I think you mentioned earlier the idea of general idea, uh, AI already, you know, um, which I guess is the long-term dream and also maybe the moment where it would become more useful for designers. Um, so certainly, I think as designers, we would be probably located, I would assume, all of us on the left side. <laughs> okay, building versus network. Matilda. Object versus network, object versus territory. Object can you, can you comment on this a bit? Um, well, object is an object and it is functions. It, let's, put it, let's put it this, is a building a product or is a building a network? Well, a building sits within a network. So there, are, I mean, design is always a question of trade-offs in some way. So every gesture, every step you take, every um, object you create creates a series of trade-offs um, that function within a network. And the and the building itself is a network yeah. because uh, you have um, sensor actuators, uh, a network of sensor actuators, and those are again connected to what you were saying: the larger internet of uh, things and people. So it's, the building is a network. You're on data science versus data politics. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, of course, I have a background as a data scientist. So I, nowadays, you would say data politics is more interesting. So <laughs> I'm kind of done with uh, data science. <laughs> Sharon, what about you? Well, I think that the nature of uh, science is that it has to be falsifiable, so it's critical, right? So when we talk about data science, is that taking data and be critical about how it works, how do you process it, what kind of hypothesis you are going to prove or disprove with it. But data politics, it's like you have a goal. You want to um, get the data to reach that goal. That's to me. And the last one for today, which is like the open hour so for, for, for the audience, mindsets, not only data sets. Leo. Say Leo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so should we agree or ex uh, explain it? Comment, <laughs> comment a bit, Spec speculate a bit. Well, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, so I think that um, maybe the, um, one of the points that, kept, that I kept on thinking about, and, and maybe also going back to the keyword that I gave, but collaboration, is the idea of, I guess, the role of the human and the designer within this 
pool of different tools and different data and different technologies, all of this changing and being disrupted and, and evolved. And I guess the mindset within this also has to, has to evolve for the designer, not like a kind of very fast way to adapt and to change and to think, which um, I mean, also, also I guess it's like what Mario Capo in the second digital turn describes as the shift from well, digital tools as ways to that help us to change how we make things to change how we think about things. So I guess maybe it's a nice way to to wrap this up because it puts <laughs> the human really or the designer as like the kind of puppeteer of all of this. Perfect. Um, thanks a lot. Um, thanks to the panel. Um, open for questions. I think, Javier, there's a mic down there. So um, be brave enough to come down to ask your question. Yes, it's over there. <laughs> you need a bit of uh, noise and uh, entertainment to bridge the silence. Yes. Right. Go ahead. Th First of all, thank you so much for that uh, really interesting discussion. Uh, my name is Jos. I'm currently building an op open source Grasshopper alternative. Um, and I have a question for all of you guys uh, regarding that topic of open source and open data. And because I wish that, what, that you, you, guys, you guys named certain tools um, that you were using. You were sometimes specific about that. Um, but I never heard anything about, the like, they all seemed closed source projects. For example, the AI you were using was trained using data. You don't know what, what they're using. Um, the, the industry of architecture is, always, is, is dominated by Revit. Uh, you don't own a Revit file. You don't know what's in there. You cannot read it. Um, so I was, this is just a sort of open statement for all of you, but um, how, would you, how do you regard open, uh, open software, open source software, and open data? How do you relate that to this discussion about uh, data and AI? So just, a, just a, a, a comment. Thank you so much for this question. I'm sure there will be another panel just about open data <laughs> at BK. So be a bit patient because the topic is huge and it's super urgent. Mm -hmm. So thanks for posing this question. And the panel is yours, Saran. Yeah, indeed, very interesting uh, question. Um, I think. Uh, well, it's it's uh, it's very um, it's about the trust, I would say, the trust that we talked about. How do we uh, the way that we could trust uh, something, data, AI, or whatever that could be disruptive to what we are doing, is to uh, get to know it. And open source is a way to get to know what is in the software, what's the output, is the interpretability of the software, and whether I can contribute to it. And that's very important. So. Uh, one of the um, uh, um, topics that we have for the exhibition today is a uh, layout of the building uh, made from a um, floor plan uh, data set. And that was made uh, by uh, open source Python programming, so completely automatic, so nothing licensed. Um, I think that's interesting to look at what can we do alternatively to the softwares and tools that you as architects, uh, you're using it, and, but might be alternative solution of open source, uh, let's say, uh, open source alternative to what you use, a licensed one. I mean, it's the question, who owns the data, right? Who owns the data, John? <laughs> yeah, that's a difficult Talking one. Talking about data politics, you know, who, who owns <laughs> the data? <laughs> uh, to, but for example, to refer back to my example that I, uh, about uh, the text generation stuff, that's indeed, it's not open source, so GPT-3 is not open source. You have open source alternatives, although uh, yeah, the disadvantage is a little bit that the output quality is just a little bit more, uh, yeah, just hasn't the high, high quality that the non-open source alternatives have. So it's, uh, it's quite a difficult choice. I do also have to say that even if you would have an open source large language model, then it's even even if you would know the sources, it would probably be this huge list of all sorts of sources. It would just be too hard to grab what's actually happening there. So I guess what that forces us to do is always be very critical, again, about the output. So is the output that these systems are generating, is this biased output, or is there a racist output, or whatever in there, and to be really 
critical critical about what's happening there and um, yeah to, uh, tweak tweak systems to um, yeah to deal with that are you satisfied with the so sorry I, I i i can only half hear you from this point of view but uh, are you okay with the, with 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 your uh, with with uh, with the answers of the panelists um, yeah, I agree that, that the, the closed source alternatives right now uh, are because they're backed by, by um, whatever they're backed by, are better alternatives. But this is like one of those things that's um, yeah, really important for academia, you know, that, that, the, that we at least should promote the alternative that uh, whatever we develop should be in the in the vision of giving as much back to as much people as possible, and I think for that purpose um, there's only one path. You know, there, like it's it's going to be really weird to um, do anything else. Um, but I understand that if you want just the best performance, you want the best out there, um, then the closed source path might be the way to go. Okay, thank you. First of all, um, Henry, do you want to answer? Is there another question? One, two, yeah, just come down, Henriette. A yeah, quick, just a, a quick comment. Yeah, just a short comment. Um, this is why I was saying that um, there are more and more alternatives that we didn't have a while ago, and what Sarah was saying as well is extremely important because there are platforms that are open source, but the, the key is to start actually early in the education of an architect to use those uh, tools that empower you basically to develop your own, uh, let's say, design tool, let's say. Yeah, thanks, Henrietta. I was instructed to move around with the microphone, so <laughs> I will do so. Uh, th thanks again, everyone. I have basically a follow-up question to what you mentioned before about the, the open source, closed source. Ah, so I should be here. Thanks, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you all again. Uh, so my, my, my question is basically picking up on something that Henrietta mentioned about the authorship beyond you know the human-centered authorship and to what extent we are willing to share it. Uh, and I think it's it's super important. And actually, it was very amusing what you said about Nietzsche. You know, would it be Nietzsche if you know we actually, you actually have an AI replicating what he's saying? So, what's the author authorship there? And I want to, since we have representatives from research, from education, from the industry, I'm wondering first to what extent are these disciplines and these domains ready to accept such a shared authorship? And even more, what it would mean if these AI, these tools, were actually now open source. Not just as, you know, who is actually claiming the value, but also who is actually having responsibility and liability. I mean, imagine, let's say, you publish a paper on science or something, like, and it's an AI writing it. Can you really debate with it, like, argue with it, or, you know, do you design a building and then, you know, someone is complaining, you know, who is actually the author of it? I'm curious how you guys think about it. What would be in its discipline, you know, the, the defenses that we saw already from the 60s, right? You remember what happened when, you know, Negroponte launched his soft architecture machines and all the architects felt they were losing agency. So this is one. But the other is, would be more like a social issue, not like a copyright thing, but actually we're putting things out there. Who is responsible for them, basically? Who's the author, right? Thanks for the question. Who is, who is responsible? <laughs> I think it's you. Can answer Joanne. this. Who who uh, owns your art? Uh? Who owns your art? <laughs> <laughs> it's very yeah, it's a very good one. But uh, it's still me who owns the art. I wrote an article. I'm not uh, far from a, a, an expert in this field, but I wrote an article last year on it with a lawyer and, uh, on ownership. She said I'm still the owner, so that's good news. Yeah. <laughs> The idea of responsibility, I think, it's a quite, quite uh, big issue. You want to comment on this? Thanks for the uh, for the statement, of course. Mm. I, uh, I don't know. I was just thinking, maybe from our perspective, 
from the industry. Uh, maybe the question is not so much about ownership because that can also be settled uh, or verified to not through agreements with uh, closed uh, source software. I think especially at the moment where maybe more and more digital tools embed something like knowledge in them, in the tool directly, um, first it's a question of transparency. And I think you see that a lot at the moment with how more and more larger, especially larger architectural firms are getting involved in building their own tools around anything under the umbrella of uh, sustainability. And I think one reason there is that there's a need for us not only to use a tool to upload a building, fill in a few settings and get carbon scores, embodied carbon operation and carbon and so on, but to be actually aware of how, what are the methods and how this is calculated and um, what are the assumptions that are embedded within, this, uh, within the algorithms of this kind of software. And therefore, it's a need for literacy, and which yeah, is a form of responsibility you know, in claims that we can make towards buildings that we intend to, that we propose to be built in the future. But I like the question because it's about the human, so-called human factor. It's, uh, it's also a nice term, right? The human factor. Um, and it's not only the question who owns the data, but also who owns the data scientist. You know, speaking about making sense, we need, we need experts to, you know, to deal with the data. So it's not about data, it's also about the knowledge, about the people. What? Can I? Go ahead. Of course. So I guess, um, Nikos, I would ask you why is authorship so important as a sub-question? Um, but I think in any case, in, in research and in design, we, we collaborate. So Leo said in the beginning, collaboration. Um, they're all collaborative efforts. I guess the question is now, can we consider AI as one of the collaborators or as someone who, something, some entity that can be considered one of the authors or one of the collaborators? Um, and I think that's a question to some extent that we, need, we still need to answer. Um, but in any case, it's never just the AI, no? The, the designers or the people working with the AI have chosen certain elements to sort of um, to 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 work with. Um, obviously, you know, like I don't know, there was a um, the AI of this space here, no, uh, over there in the exhibition, and there are like I don't know, 20 images of this specific space. Um, if you're using that within design, there would be then a selection process. Again, that would be a collaboration as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I guess the question is, why is authorship important? And on the other side, can we consider AI as one of the authors? Um, we have another question. Oh, in the yeah, middle there? And on the line, on the white line. On the white line. Can everybody hear me? Okay, nice. It's about the face the camera. It's about, a it's, a, it's a really open question about the objectification of life and architecture. Um, so we label everything in data. And this is a bit a question that bothers me for, say, two, three months, maybe now. I'm a data scientist working together with Saran. How, how ca can we label or can we actually um, categorize or objectify architecture and will this Will AI actually reinforce this unnatural thing? Or is it an unnatural thing? And how do you reflect on it within the design process? It's a really open question. I don't know if you understand it. <laughs> so it was first posed by Kate Crawford in her book, The Atlas of AI, um, in the part it's about, that it's about data. And she said it might be reinforcing the belief that, he, that we can actually categorize everything, mm -hmm. um, and we'll, how do you reflect on this? I mean, yeah, I mean, for me personally, I find, I find it actually almost the opposite that I have a maybe speculative or optimistic view on AI that it can challenge um, taxonomies or categorizations in architecture. I feel like that's, that's something that's already happening without the use of AI or machine learning or anything like that. If you just look at GIS and uh, BIM modeling, um, both of those are very strong and rigorous uh, protocols and categorizations, which at some point grow and grow to a level of complexity that we can't make sense of them anymore. So I feel like in, there's something in maybe unsupervised learning mechanisms and in in a certain fuzziness also of um, outputs of machine learning or neural networks that 
could be a form of liberating, <laughs> maybe or overcoming the needs for this, like giving categories of subcategories or subcategories of subcategories and, and and so on. So yeah, maybe I have more of an optimistic or curious view on that. Yeah. So on the, on the one, I think it has two sides to it. So on the one hand, the AI definitely is often this kind of reinforcement of just one of, of the human view on something about the people who built the data sets, for example. On the other hand, you could also use AI uh, in more inspiring ways to actually yeah, think or come up with new labels that you might not have thought of yourself. So maybe to go back again to GPT-3 or these kind of image recognition based textual description systems could also generate all sorts of, you know, you could look at the building and it could be labeled like color material, uh, you know, the really dry stuff, but you could also label it with more poetic uh, descriptions or more, uh, I don't know, uh, compare it to paintings. That's something you could build with uh, AI. So kind of give this like uh, painting art wise, like textual description of what a building is, for example, which could be refreshing and inspiring maybe. So I think that's, Kasper, I think that's a very poetic way of um, um, disrupting the panel um, due to time. Um, but of course, everybody is, is, uh, is invited, I think, uh, to continue the discussion uh, in the orange hall. I want to say thank you to, to all, um, to the audience still, still there. Thank you for the, uh, to the panelists um, coming from uh, Barcelona and, uh, and uh, elsewhere. And thanks Javier, of course, and his... Uh, team for organizing BK Talks, like always, perfect. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone, panelists, moderator, for accepting the invitation. Um, I just want to invite everyone for the next BK Talks that is going to take place next April 7th. It's probably uh, been the most difficult BK Talk to organize since I started this adventure two years ago. It's called Apocalypse. I guess everybody's sort of rejecting that term. So uh, I have had many difficulties to organize a BK Talk that is called Apocalypse. It's been canceled, I think, three or four times due to COVID, due to disruption. So talking about Apocalypse is, of course, a now very uncomfortable uh, matter so if anyone wants to join, there's still room here on the floor because I have the impression that um, many experts don't like to talk about certain topics. So I don't know, uh, I don't know what we are going to talk about exactly. Uh, what we want to do is to address the current planetary urgencies, not only planetary urgencies, but the urgencies that surround us. You know that we are surrounded, surrounded not only by the pandemic that we never expected that would happen to us. I don't know if that was apocalypse. Uh, we are now in the middle of a war. We didn't probably expect that war was going to happen. I wasn't. Um, last week, there was this impressive Sahara uh, storm dust which covered, I was in Spain at that moment, which covered the whole country in orange, uh, thinking of the idea of this apocalypse. So what we would like to do or to talk about on April 7th is about speeding up official agendas. I wonder if that's possible in the midst of this amount of urgencies. Can we as citizens do more and faster? How to reach true social and ecological justice? How to address rampant urbanization? overpopulation, migrations, aggressive misogyny, imperialism, white supremacism, capitalist exploitation of the earth, or an artificial intelligence takeover. So um, besides uh, having a drink, I invite you all to join us on April 7th and try to discuss some part of this and find, I don't know, some agenda for the future. Thank you very much and see you soon, bye.